Uh, we're, we're going to begin by reading a few verses in Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, and I'll start reading in verse 1. I'll read um, just the first three verses and then we'll skip down a little bit. But in Matthew chapter 13, verse 1, it says, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of the parable. Uh, maybe at, at a, another time, when we get to the point where the parables explain, we'll go back and read that section. But now let's skip down to verse 9. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken, taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, Neither do they understand. And I'll stop reading there. I thought it would be um, you know, interesting to go through Matthew 13 because there's a lot of um, just, just information here that relates to the time of the end, the time we're living in. Like, for instance, the, the parable of the wheat and the tares is in this chapter which deals with the, um, the end of the church age and God's command to His people to come out. But before we do that, I, I think it would be good for us to look at parables in general. Just, just what the Bible has to say about parables. For example, what's the definition of a parable? And if I ask 100 family radio listeners that, Probably 90 some percent, I know what answer they're going to give. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Is that true or false? Yes, it's true. That is a definition of Christ's parables. But I guess what I'm, what I'm thinking of is uh, we, we know it, and it's said later on here in Matthew 13. Uh, in verses 34-35, it says, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. So without a parable, he did not speak. We, we know that's true. And we also know that Jesus is the Word, the Word made flesh. So he's the essence of the Bible. And, and we've understood this to mean that you have to look at the whole Bible as a parable. But the problem is with the definition that Mr. Camping gave and, uh, you know, a couple of times you would hear a caller call up and try and, try and um, you know, touch on this point. The problem is that definition is not sufficient to cover the whole Bible. Because the whole Bible is not written in an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That is, the whole Bible is not stated as Jesus would say a parable, the kingdom of heaven is like. For example, in John 3.16, it's not stated that way. Is John 3.16 a parable? You have people say, no, it's not. Or in 2 Peter chapter 3, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Is that a parabolic statement? And, 
and, and there's many statements in Romans and other places that you cannot um, say falls under that definition of an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Which means if we're going to say, and, and I've tried to look at this because when, when you're teaching, you're always going to find someone who, who wants to come and, okay, you say the whole Bible is, is a parable. And you say the definition of a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. What about this verse? Well, no, you have to understand that differently. Okay, so it's not the whole Bible. See? You see the problem? Which means the definition is not sufficient. It's not complete. And when we really look at parables, we see that the definition of a parable, and this would sum up all the scripture, is that which serves to hide truth. Does Jesus' parables, the kingdom of heaven is like, hide truth? Without any question. It, a couple thousand years later, we're still trying to understand the meaning of some of the statements that Christ made when he spoke in those parables. Does John 3.16 hide truth for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? Wasn't it just relatively recently we learned what it meant that Christ was the Son, the only begotten Son. We had no idea what that meant. No one in all the church age understood John 3.16 until relatively recently because it's a parable. It's a, it's a statement that is designed by God to hide truth. And, and, and hidden truth is said to be a mystery. That's why the, um, going back here in verse 11, when the disciples said, Why do you speak unto them in parables? Then verse 11, He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And, and that uh, would apply to every hidden truth. Every hidden truth that, that the people of God have revealed to them and then come to know is a mystery. Mystery is a definition of a parable. And uh, for example, the Apostle Paul said, a mystery has been revealed to me. What was it that, that he figured out a parable? No, the mystery was the many statements in the Old Testament that spoke of the Gentiles being fellow heirs with the Jews. And nobody understood it because it was hidden truth. It was a mystery. The Jews did not understand it. Not until we get to the first century. And then the Lord opens up the eyes of Peter with the, the vision of the unclean animals. He opens up the eyes of the Apostle Paul. And then the Apostle Paul understands the mystery that's revealed to him. It, it, it was... And then... You can look back in, in the uh, Old Testament and it's plain as day. It's plain as day. But because God sealed it up or, or until that time and hid it, then um, it was like a parable. Okay, so, so a parable defined, again, is that which hides truth. And uh, hidden truth ties in with the time of the end, doesn't it? Because we've been overwhelmed. At the time of the end, as God sealed up the word, He said to Daniel, why don't we look at Daniel 12. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4 says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So the word is sealed till the time of the end. And how did God seal it? Did He use invisible ink? He didn't use invisible ink. We, everybody's always been able to see the same Hebrew text, Greek text, um, 
The partial Aramaic in the Old Testament, the ink's always been there, the words have always been there, but God sealed it up as he seals, or the technique he uses to seal and to hide truth is to make it a parable. He, he hides it in various ways. And also here in Daniel 12, verses 9 and 10, And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. You know, we, we just read um, uh, uh, th this same thing in Matthew 13, except it was worded differently. Didn't we read that? It is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. And here the word sealed up at the time of the end when knowledge increases. Who understands? The wise, the one it's given to. Who doesn't understand? The wicked. It's not given to them. So, so God sealed up the information that he intended to reveal at the time of the end. And the way he did it, the manner in which he did it, was to make it parabolic. To hide it like a mystery, like, like the whole Bible's been hidden. And like Christ taught us how to read and study and come to truth and, and to gain knowledge in the Bible. And God knew his people would always follow that, that same manner. And, and so um, he just kept it in reserve until the proper time. Well, now an, another thing we want to look at is that um, and, and this relates to all the information that was sealed up till the time of the end, which is that doctrine is derived from parables. Now this is something that kind of surprised me. Um, and, and you can read that in Mark chapter 4. Uh, it surprised me that it was so plainly stated, and I never noticed it before. In Mark 4, which is the parallel passage to Matthew 13, it says in verse 2, And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. So you see the, the tie-in? He taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine. Parables are spoken, and it's the same as doctrine. Of course, the only thing with this kind of doctrine is that you can hear the parable, but the doctrine's hidden. It's mysterious. It's something that, that you can hear and not hear, or you could see and not see and, and fail to understand. But, but uh, doctrine is derived from parables. Just think of these doctrines. Now, now this is very convenient. <laughs> I, I like this, Eddie. See these doctrines? These are mainly doctrines that were sealed up till the time of the end and, and have been understood over the last, you know, 15, 20 years of the Great Tribulation leading into the Day of Judgment. And you can, you can just go down the list. For example, Sunday is the New Testament Sabbath day. And, uh, I, you know, don't worry, I'm not going to go through every bullet point. <laughs> I think we went through this before <laughs> when <laughs> um, I, uh, I said I had so many points to make, but I won't do that. But Sunday is the New Testament Sabbath day. Was that always understood by the churches? No. They, they correctly worshipped on Sunday, but if you would have asked them, why are we worshiping on Sunday? They might have pointed you to some Old Testament scriptures that spoke of the seventh day Sabbath and, and completely misunderstood and thought it was a day of rest. They, they didn't really know 
Because God sealed it up until the time of the end. And he, he, he sealed it up in an interesting way. He allowed, I think, every single translator in every single language who translated the Bible to mistranslate Matthew 28.1 or Mark 16.1. Remember that uh, it says in Matthew 28 in verse 1 in the King James, in the end of the Sabbath, and the word Sabbath is singular, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. And the word week is singular. And, uh, and, and yet in the Greek, it's sabbaton, in both places, which is a plural word. So it should be translated in the end of the Sabbath as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbath. It's not the word week, it's the word Sabbath. But God permitted it. In this case, he just used mistranslation to serve his own purposes to hide truth. And the coming forth of this, finally at the end, is a mystery revealed. You know, Matthew 13 speaks of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, plural. And from time to time, we'll see the word mystery singular. And it's various mysteries, like the Gentiles coming in. Um, I, w I was stuck a long time on Revelation 10, verse 7, because it said when the, the seventh trumpet uh, shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. And when you look at the word begin, it's a Greek word that should be translated about. It, it's used of the Apostle John, I was about to write. And so it should say, um, I'll, I'll look at it. Turn there so I don't get it wrong. Math, uh, Revelation 10 verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin, it, uh, that's better translated, be about to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he has declared to his servants the prophets. And I was really confused by that, because we know the sounding of the seventh angel's judgment day, and the, if the mystery of God is finished when he begins, or when he's about to sound, before he's even sounded, then I, I just kept thinking of the definition of a parable, that parables are mysteries, and I, I misread it. I, mis, I was reading this as plural. The mysteries of God are finished. But it doesn't say the mysteries, it says mystery, singular, which could apply to any mystery. And, and then it... it uh, it hit, if you go over to Romans 11, in Romans 11, verse 25 and 26, it says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. That's the mystery that is finished, be, you know, God had to save everyone, then sound the seventh trumpet, the final trumpet, judgment day. And, and so it's not the mystery of continuing to open the scriptures to reveal mysteries. It's not all these other things we've been learning, in other words, but it's a particular mystery having to do with the fact that Gentiles and Jews were all together sheep were all together um, um, in, in the family of God and all have been saved, thus finishing that particular mystery. And, 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 and so the, um, the, the word mysteries is significant in Matthew 13 and it has to do with all kinds of things that the Lord has been opening up. All manner of doctrines. And I'll give a, an example. I'm not going to go through all of them, but this one is up here too, I think. Yeah, the church age is over. 
The church age is over. That, of course, was just revealed uh, to us, to our understanding, around 2001. And, and then the, the, um, the declaration was made that the church age was over and, and the elect had to come out, you know, had to flee out of the church. Well, how did we learn about the end of the church age? And, and this was the problem with those within the churches and congregations. Primarily, it was through Mr. Camping's Bible study in the book of Jeremiah. And in the book of Jeremiah, he was studying about Judah and Jerusalem and the house of God, the temple. And, and he was drawing spiritual conclusions. He, he was saying now, basically, this is a historical parable. And this is what Judah represents. Judah represents the church. And Jerusalem typifies the corporate church. And, and you see, and then you have um, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, type of Satan, and Babylon, the kingdom of Satan. And they come and destroy Judah and Jerusalem and take everybody into captivity. All oh, spiritual picture after spiritual picture after spiritual picture. And what did people in the churches say? What did their theologians say and the pastors say? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? That you're, don't you know how to read the Bible? Don't you know how to understand Scripture? It, this is speaking of what happened to Judah historically way back then, thousands of years ago, and has nothing to do with the church. And, and, uh, or we could go Matthew 24. In Matthew chapter 24 where we read in verses 15 and 16, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So not only do we have a doctrine of the end of the church, we had a doctrine that God's elect had to come out of the church. You had to leave the church and go out into the world based on references to Judah. It doesn't say church here. It doesn't say church anywhere in the book of Jeremiah that I'm aware of. So why uh, or how is it that we understood it that way? Because when Christ spoke in parables, he taught them his doctrine. And, and doctrine is derived from a parable. If you listen to uh, church theologians, I doubt they would, they would make that statement. They would say, no, you need a plain, clear, literal statement of Scripture in order to develop a doctrine. You don't develop doctrine from parable. And, and yet, uh, that's not true. That's not true. Just read Mark 4, verse 2. And, and, and Christ spoke in parables. He, he taught us His doctrine. And it, it, it's, it's guaranteed because to you it's given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And to them it's not given. So when the Lord opens the Scriptures and His intent is to separate wheat from tares. His purpose is to divide a people that have been growing together over the course of the church age, almost 2,000 years. And at the time of the end, the word sealed up. Now, he'll, he'll make it known. And, and it's revealed to everyone. It was declared to everyone. Whether saved or unsaved, wheat or a tear, people in the church has heard. And yet, only the wise understood. The wise will know. None of the wicked will know or understand. And, and, and that's the mechanism. It's the giving of ears to hear and eyes to see and understanding 
to perceive that caused the separation that brought the people of God out in obedience to a command that was given in a mystery. It was, it was delivered in the form of a mystery being revealed. And, and God's people uh, reacted and responded obediently to it.